with classical computing, do you reach some limitations and you run up against physical barriers. And one of those is just related to the ever decreasing size of the things that are actually bits or doing the computation. And at these small length scales, you start to affect atoms, individual atoms, and you need to worry about this sort of different regime of physics, which is typically related to these smaller systems, which is quantum mechanics. Okay, let's get started as soon as possible. Uh, my pleasure to uh, have Eric today defending his thesis, and we were excited to be able to ask some questions. Thank you. Great. Have a, have a good, thank you. good talk. I am a, I guess I'm into my sixth, starting my seventh year uh, at UCSB in the physics PhD program. So I'm going to be talking today about some of uh, my work in the group and title here, Computing Prime Factors Using a Josephson Phase Qubit Quantum Processor. So I thought I would start with just sort of introducing the ideas of classical computing and can look at where we are. So if you think back to the, around the 50s when we had this tabletop transistor which occupied a meter squared, all right, and here we are today with uh, Intel's Sandy Bridge technology, which fits a billion transistors in about a chip this size, 100 millimeters squared. As you continue to press these smaller and smaller sizes, you no longer can do the same things that you were able to do. And you need to start, you can either compete with that or you can decide to harness that power. And the copper powder filters are up here. Wow, I haven't seen these before. Yeah, the copper can, dude. It's looking hot. Right, I'm gonna pull off the bias T's with the box and just leave the attenuators. So I'm gonna pull from the attenuators. Does okay. that make sense? No, I don't so, know. So pull from here. Why? So we just, I wanna bring the bias T in the box. Together with the box. Okay, yeah, uh, that's exactly what I was not doing. It's not just that we're gonna try to make a better laptop or a better new phone or whatever. It's actually you know, a disruptive technology and that it would be a different style of computing. It solves problems that on a classical computer are intractable that you just cannot do. Let's first put on a safety can here and then so do don't yeah. Let's come down. I just went to a splash on top. Stop. Uh, no rings falling out. Yeah, it's fine. Be... Nice. Perfect. Yeah. You tore a little mile on that. Yeah. Cool. Hey, and, and definitely here. Oh, that's a fixable problem. Thanks, guys. This yeah. Great. As an experimentalist, within the group that I work at, uh, the expectations are to be able to basically propose an experiment and be able to do every part of that experiment and ideally successfully execute the experiment, um, not only in the sense of taking the correct data and analysis and all of that, but also being able to write it up. In scientific journals, I mean, that's kind of important for your kind of career and what people typically are going to be interested in. Um, of course, the exciting parts about quantum computing is even the underlying fact that we're using quantum mechanics to do this computation now. And rather than these really certain you know, position or momentum operators and things where you can actually say that, like a particle is actually located here it becomes this wash. It's actually a probability distribution of where these things can be found. And what we do in quantum computing is it's actually a number of experiments are run to come up with a probability. The quantum bit, this qubit, when we measure it, it's going to collapse into one of these things, either zero or one. But as you repeat the experiments, you get these probabilities of the system, right? And it can be actually in a superposition of states where it's both zero and one. And the question is whether this is really something useful to have. And then in practice, can we actually build such a device? So, all right, a practical use of a quantum computer might be, say, to compute prime factors. Let me frame the picture. Multiplying two large numbers is challenging for most humans, but relatively straightforward for a classical computer. Recall that computers used to be used as calculators, not just social networking devices. Finding the prime factors is the reverse problem. The challenge here is, say I give you some composite number, n, where n is composed of uh, p times q. And we seek these prime factors, p and q. Okay, sounds easy enough. 
Well, uh, let's maybe try something like a, the RSA number 2048, which is about a six, 617 decimal digit composite number uh, that looks like this. So if you like, I can give you guys some scratch paper and wait a few minutes here for everyone to try to factor this. <laughs> um, and we'll start a clock and let's, let's see how long it takes to actually compute this. So what is the time to compute? Well, if I arm you with sort of the best classical known algorithm, which is the uh, general number field sieve. And uh, I'll take Peter Shor's algorithm, the quantum algorithm, and we'll press the, the, the go button, right? And we'll wait. So it's gonna take about the age of the universe for you to solve it with the uh, kind of classical uh, general number field sieve. Whereas it'll be on the order of seconds here with Peter Shor's algorithm. All right, it's this image that really motivated me to actually do this experiment. So why is this relevant? Or why should anyone care? Well, say so you want to send secure information on the web, right? Uh, you give a credit card number, bank account, whatever. We encrypt that information between you and the seller, the, the vendor, whoever, with basically this RSA encryption scheme, which relies fundamentally on using these large composite numbers that are composed of two very big prime numbers multiplied together to give you that number as kind of the key with which we use to pass this information back and forth. However, with Peter Shor's algorithm, the quantum computer, one could crack this very quickly, right? With order of seconds rather than the age of the universe, right? So then the question is, well, what security do we have left? What's great is there's actually quantum encryption, which one can actually find out if someone is eavesdropping on their transmission via quantum entanglement. And it's a much stronger test of your information, of how well you secure your information. So the experiment that I'm working on is to actually map this idea of using Peter Soares' algorithm to factor uh, a composite number. Uh, one would need a lot more resources uh, to actually factor larger numbers. So I've been working about five years to factor 15 into its prime factors. Gone into the clean room, I've made a device. I have a quantum processor composed of nine quantum elements. Then we insert one of these devices in a superconducting cavity wire bond it to make electrical connections, and mount it in a helium-3, helium-4 dilution refrigerator. Thanks, guys. I think, I think that's it. I mean, the rest are, I'm going to take this can off and finish wiring the, the boxes. Appreciate it. And in order to remove thermal noise and enter the regime dominated by quantum mechanics, we evacuate the chamber and cool the quantum processor just above absolute zero. Um, and it is with this quantum processor that I'm going to, again, try to find the factors of 15. How's it going? OK, we should talk. OK. We've been talking about this. Is this folklore and myth, or is this science? So if we want to keep this as folklore and myth, we don't do anything. And we return that we get, uh, indeed, that 15 equals 3 times 5, 48% uh, of the time. Sorry, the forty-eight percent success rate—that was what you were, you were supposed to get. Um, Ideally, you should get fifty percent, right? Yeah. That's the best that Shor's algorithm will oh, do. Okay. Is fifty percent. Okay. Yeah. So, this is clearly just beautiful work, but it does make me wonder. So, what's the number of qubits we're aiming for? A thousand, ten million. Uh, 10 million would be great. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that'll be next year, do you think? Yeah, I think that'll be next year. Are you recording that? <laughs> <laughs>